Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, I like usually to start my presentations with either an apology or a story. And today I'm actually going to start with a story. Uh, this is a story in space and time. It's a story uh, about knitting. It's a story about overbroad and overreaching copyright claims. It's a story about 3D printing, but most importantly, it's a story about a shark. I really hope it, it's, it's going to make sense. During the reign of uh, David Tennant as the Tenth Doctor. Now, during that season, there was uh, the introduction of a very interesting little monster called the Adipox. If you're, even if you're a Doctor Who fan, as far as Doctor Who monsters come, this wasn't very remarkable. Evidence of this is that it hasn't really been repeated again. Uh, but this little monster has uh, a little piece of history in copyright uh, history. Um, shortly after the episode was released, uh, a Doctor Who enthusiast and a knitter uh, that goes uh, online for the, uh, with the moniker Masmatas, uh, created her own knitted version of, uh, of the adipose. And uh, she had her own version, and he sh uh, she shared it with uh, some friends. And uh, most importantly, she created some instructions, some knitting instructions that she uploaded to her website, where other knitters would be able to knit and create their own version. Now. Uh, this uh, is transformation. It's, a, uh, it's what we call sometimes in copyright uh, a transformative use. Uh, nothing happened, happened for a couple of weeks until the BBC <coughs> found out that she had some of these designs in her website. And then they sent her a threatening letter saying that she should take down the knitted adipose instructions because it was infringing uh, a Doctor Who copyright and characters and etc. Uh, of course, you know, you can imagine she, she wasn't doing this for commercial gain, she was just sharing things with the community. And uh, she was quite concerned. She contacted uh, uh, an, an NGO uh, that deals with uh, digital rights issues uh, called the Open Rights Group here in the UK, and uh, they put her in contact with several people, uh, several organizations. And legal experts, amongst them myself, uh, we started writing about this because think about it. Really, what, what she did was not copy the character. She created, with her skill and her labor and her knitting know-how, uh, knitting kung fu, you could say, uh, th th that she created this uh, new version of the adipose that other people who knew how to knit would be able to copy. So I think, and many legal experts that were uh, thinking about this at the time, uh, realized that probably she wasn't infringing. Now, thankfully, uh, the Doctor Who uh, fandom, uh, it's also quite adept at knitting. Uh, since uh, Tom Baker's uh, very iconic uh, scarf, uh, uh, they've been knitting uh, all the time. So the community took the call and they started defending Masmatas and it, it started getting traction and a couple of you know, newspaper articles were written uh, a lot of famous people, Neil Gaiman amongst them, uh, took, the, took the call and started defending her and saying, this is not a copyright infringement. Um, then um, the BBC realized that they should not be alienating their fans and they decided to drop, uh, drop the issue because this was quite bad PR for them. You, know, you do not want to uh, be attacking your fans. Now, uh, they dropped it and uh, they sailed with her and uh, eventually she went on uh, to have a very successful knitting career. I understand that now she uh, uh, has done some designs for those innocent little hats that you may have seen in the shops. Um, it was a good result for her, but for us legal experts uh, that uh, sometimes like cer certainty, uh, we didn't get a decision on transformative uses. Um, I think that if this had made it to court, she probably would have won. Because the case law from then on has been leading us into a very interesting uh, uses of transformative use uh, that do not protect things that may, be, may have a functional element. Something like this helmet. 
I was reminded of this story um, just recently uh, during <coughs> this year's Super Bowl. Um, uh, during, uh, if, uh, if you are uh, familiar with what happens in those events, um, uh, there is a show in the halftime, and this year's uh, show was by Katy Perry, the pop singer. And part of the show, which was very brash and very bright, were two dancing sharks. Now, immediately, everyone follows this, and also millions of people following this, started realizing that the left shark messed up his choreography. It was completely out of sync, and he was started dancing, and, the other, and, and Katy Perry and the other shark were in sync, and uh, this left shark wasn't. So the internet being the internet immediately created a sensation. He, he became a, a, an instant sensation. It was left shark was a trending topic on Twitter for several hours, I think actually for almost a day. He became a, a hit, memes, images, t-shirts, uh, animated GIFs, uh, you, you name it, Tumblrs were created, uh, uh, a Twitter account was created with Left Shark. Now, <laughs> he became such a sensation that one artist uh, decided to create a little figurine and scanned it. And scanned it so that it could be uploaded as a file to servers and sold uh, as a 3D print. So you could, in theory, go to a website and download it and, and, uh, if you bought it. So it was for commercial purposes. Immediately, the lawyers of uh, Katy Perry, who I didn't know this, but apparently she uh, keeps a, a, a group of lawyers, um, started um, sending a letter to uh, this artist, to Fernando Sosa, who created it claiming that he was in infringement of copyright, of the intellectual property uh, that she was holding over the shark, and threatened him with legal action, uh, and he had to remove the file. Uh, he did remove the file, but immediately, as again, the internet uh, responds to uh, these things as censorship and uh, starts reacting immediately, people and legal experts started making the opinion that this was very broad legal claim. Now, I don't want to bore you with the legal details, but uh, particularly in the United States, there is enough case law to indicate that this would fall under a doctrine called fair use. And probably also that the, uh, the costume itself does not have adequate protection under copyright, because it's a disguise. It's not something that would be protected under copyright. It's more functional. It's something that has functional elements. Now. Uh, the file was uploaded again, and nowadays, if you want, you can download the file and you can buy the uh, 3D print or send it to a service where you can get the 3D print. You could. So I did. <laughs> uh, I hope it was easier to get. So here he is. Uh, the shark will be available for selfies and pictures afterwards. <laughs> um, what is interesting about this is that Katy Perry's uh, lawyers immediately realized, okay, this is not protected. So they try to uh, apply for a left shark um, uh, okay. trademark. You can probably see something wrong with this application. They use the same shark figurine that they were trying to get out of the internet for their trademark app application. So they canceled it immediately. People online realized that this was, uh, this was happening. So you can now still access the file. Now, there is a serious point to this. It's not all sharks and, and fun and Daleks. Um, I think that, the th the, that the Katy Perry shark and left shark are the opening salvo in what is going to become more prevalent uh, copyright war. The likes of probably are similar to what we saw with music and file sharing uh, during the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, what's going to happen is that you will be able, as the technology uh, starts becoming cheaper and starts becoming more prevalent, 
uh, you'll be able to download things from, uh, from the internet, make your own version of things. If you're playing Minecraft or any game, you can create and transpose and translate those models into real life. If you're into World of Warcraft or anything else, you can download and, uh, and 3D print your magic sword. Uh, or even it, more interestingly, you will be able to scan Lego pieces and create your own Lego versions. So we are entering a, a, a very different world. And this talk, um, I'm trying to use this um, platform to give an idea uh, that, uh, that uh, me and several other uh, corporate experts have been thinking about. Um, just recently, there has been a revision, or there's a proposed revision of European uh, copyright law uh, on, in the works. Uh, there is now a report by the Pirate Party in Germany's uh, MEP, Julia Reda, and this report recognizes the existence of transformative uses. Now, it does not change the law. This is not asking for a change in the law, but at least it's a step forward. It's recognizing that the existence of this amazing creative force that exists on the internet that is informing us and is creating new ways or, or new ways of looking at uh, at fun uh, fiction. So my proposal, and I, something that uh, I've been thinking for quite a while, is maybe to create a copyright exception for things like fan art and transformative uses that are fan expressions. Now, this would be for non-commercial purposes particularly, but also it's things that would inform and, and, and it would enrich the, the property. Now, this is something that already that very smart uh, users are able to do and very smart uh, companies are able to permit. Some game companies use their fans to, to enrich their, uh, 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 their content. And they allow fans to create versions and to create t-shirts and to create YouTube channels that inform and reach and, and to unleash all this amazing creativity that the internet brings. And I think that if we had a, 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 a copyright exception that dealt with these types of users, then uh, we would not have all of these threatening letters that uh, some people have sometimes. So uh, thank you, and I hope you support transformative uses. Thank you very much.